Merry Christmas and welcome everyone to our uh, gathering time, our interaction time this morning uh, in our series on the indwelling life of Christ, all of him and all of me. We're going to be discussing what Major Thomas refers to as the complete answer. Now, you know, if you've been around uh, myself uh, any length of time, you know that I don't necessarily prefer to refer to Jesus as the answer. <laughs> uh, now he's much more personal than just an answer, but it's okay. Jesus has certainly made us complete, and we are learning how to function complete in him. So we're going to read this first, and then we'll, we'll talk about it together. He says the Christians of the early church have been described as being, how do you pronounce that? In, 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 incorrigibly, incorrigibly happy, completely unafraid, and nearly always in trouble. No, don't get the wrong idea, folks. <laughs> They're in trouble for the right reasons, <laughs> not for the wrong ones, and there is a difference. The early church. <laughs> so... <laughs> That is gloriously true, and Paul gives us an illustration of this attitude in the second epistle to the Corinthians when he was in a situation that was beyond human endurance. So I think we're all going to be able to relate to this, aren't we? Situations were beyond your ability, right? Uh, we were burdened, Paul said, and beyond measure... He says, so that we were despaired even of life. Been there, done that. Anybody else? Yes, yep. Then he goes on. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. He was adapting this attitude, our present difficulty is not our problem. It sounds like my counseling sessions. Whatever those presenting problems are that you bring, they're their problems, I'm not denying that, but they're really not the main problem. And that's what Major's saying. Our present difficulty is not our problem, it is his problem. It is in the hands of our God who raises the dead. Here was Paul dying to self, and this dying to self allowed him to hand the whole situation over to the one indwelling him, Jesus Christ, the God of resurrection power. Dying to self is a wonderful position to be in. I like this. Dying to self is a wonderful position to be in because dead people cannot die. And dead people do not have problems. You see, every time you give yourself the right to have a problem or the right to worry about something, you give yourself the right to live your own life. And I would say kind of. <laughs> You're not really living your own life. That's kind of the delusion of the thing. Uh, you may be participating with another's life or another's solutions, but you're not an independent self. He goes on to say, however, you adapt an attitude. However, if you adapt an attitude of total dependence on the life of the Lord Jesus, the only life with which God will ever credit you, then no matter how threatening a situation may be, you can relate it to him. It. Amen? Amen? You can relate it to him. You can say, imagine this, thank you, Lord. I know it's hard sometimes to imagine that we could actually thank the Lord for the situations we find ourselves in. But thank you, Lord, this is no longer my problem or my worry. It is yours. This is the quality of life 
that gives you the peace of God that passes all understanding. It is the quality of life that staggers your neighbors, leaving them perplexed and baffled as they see you remain on such an even keel in situations which would completely demoralize them. This is the privilege that is yours and mine in Jesus Christ. It applies to every single situation in life without exception to every decision you may be confronted with today to every temptation that faces you and to every responsibility you may be called upon to carry. Amen. It's pretty powerful. Yeah. This truth always applies. The Lord Jesus, the God of resurrection life, indwells you bodily with all the adequacy of the Godhead. And then he quotes Colossians 2.10, and you are complete in him. I love Paul's thoughts in Philippians 4.13 in the Amplified Bible. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am sufficient in Christ. I'm sorry? It says I am self-sufficient. Yeah, I'm changing that. Okay. <laughs> I am sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I don't have any self-sufficiency. So I don't like the Amplified in that regard. So that's why I left that little self-sufficiency out. <laughs> <laughs> Paul needed no crutches because through dependence on Christ's completeness and competency, he himself was completely competent. Notice why you're competent. Because of the competency of Christ. To be wholly and completely and exclusively dependent on Christ's competence, that is the Christian life. So you could see that wherever there's that disconnect in our life, doesn't mean you're not Christian. It just means you're not experiencing what it means to be Christian. And obviously there is a, a difference in our lives. And it's that little difference between belief and faith. Stay tuned for some future broadcasts on that subject. <laughs> it is not just the monopoly of, of, a, of the few, nor is it the privilege only of God's special favorites. It is the life for which you were redeemed. Christ's precious blood was shed to reconcile you to God. I like that. You, notice, what was this whole deal about that God through Christ did for you? This is getting you right so that you could participate with him and experience his life. Amen. This really wasn't a whole lot about you per se, other than to get you right so that you could experience life as he intended. Boy, that'll tweak a lot of folks right there. <laughs> Not about you as much as you thought it was. <laughs> Exactly. So, so it does not mean you will avoid pressures and threats and discomforts, but you, but you can know that in every situation, you have the complete, total, and absolute answer in Christ, your life. He is the answer. So I would say he is the life. See, we're not just trying to glean information. We're not just trying to understand principles. We're not just trying to 
learn how to do this life the way maybe he would want us to do it. No, we, he, he is wanting us to experience his life, experience him, relate to him, to allow him to be the expression of our life, which I like to refer to as the outlived life of Jesus Christ. That's completely different. And it's very important. To live a life less than this is to miss the whole point of your redemption. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So there's three questions for us, and I'd like to start with these questions this morning for some interaction, okay? The first one is, what current problems in your particular have you been giving yourself the right to worry? How instead can you relate each of these situations to God, release them to his responsibility? What are some of the particulars? Now, I know that some of our particulars might be real personal. So some of them we may not want to share all the particular details. But maybe you can share it in such a way that you give us a summary, a summarization. So what current problems have you been giving yourself the right to be overly concerned, to worry, to be anxious, to fret? Maybe lose a little sleep over. Now, first of all, don't all look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's talk, real. You guys got his hand up in the air. <laughs> yeah, David. Call it future retirement. Okay, future retirement. You go way out there. <laughs> or lack thereof. So what does Jesus say about our retirement and, and, and the concern that we would have of us being taken care of in the future? What does he say? Okay, and that's a concept. Don't worry about tomorrow, what you will eat and what you will wear. Yes, he's, he, what, what illustration does he give? He says, birds. yeah, the birds of the field, the lilies of the valley, do they, do they toil, do they spin? They don't do any of that, and yet they're clothed with the most beautiful array. And Yeah, so. So you feel better, Dick? <laughs> yeah, you know that the, the whole thing of I, I understand, and that's good. But the whole thing of so-called security in the temporal realm, how secure is everything? I've got a good friend that uh, was pretty secure in his situation in another country and and that country is starting to kind of fall apart, and maybe the security that he had might be going with it. <laughs> uh, people that have had great investments and portfolios, and all of a sudden, overnight, it's gone. So it sometimes kind of helps us to understand, as Jesus said, I think in that same context, if I'm not for, uh, if I'm not. Uh, if I'm, if I'm correct, he says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I think it's the same context, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we, we're, we tend to be a lot more, and, and I'm talking to all of us, you know, it's like, there's no criticism in this. It's just observation. It's just kind of where we've been at times, we tend to be more worldly-minded about things than we ought. We're not as spiritually aware of, yes? I just wanted to say when you, you know, the problems always come, but when you can detach yourself from them and understand it's okay, you know, then you can rejoice in these problems because you can look past them and see the future of, okay, you know what, I don't, God, it's not my desire to walk through this struggle or to wrestle with it, but I trust you, 
and I know that at some point in time things will change. And yeah, and even if they don't, because let's be honest, there are situations, I was just yeah. telling um, a spouse this week, the, the couple was coming together. Uh, one of them is choosing not to come. Very significant issues in their life. Um, probably some imbalance. And so the one that was coming was hopeful that if the mate would participate and experience some of God's grace healing activity, that at least at some point they could believe that their mate would be restored to a more normal relationship. And I said, be careful. Mm -hmm. That may not occur. Don't have those kinds of expectations because sometimes it doesn't occur. So then what? What if we're stuck with a very dysfunctional situation? We can't change it. Nobody else can change it. And it's, it's difficult. It's hurtful. It's painful. Then what? Do we just rejoice? Do we just bail? <laughs> Yeah, and, it, and, and we, it's more than just taking it to God. It's beginning to live out of him as our life, as, I hate to say the word resource, but, you know, he's more than a resource, isn't he? Beginning to experience life without allowing the things of the journey to have to be resolved the, the reality is if, if that particular problem gets re resolved, praise God, there's just going to be a new one, isn't there? You know, so pick your poison. <laughs> if we're constantly fixated on the problems and the necessity of resolution of the problem, then where is our focus? Yeah, ourselves. His, his ways are not our ways. So exactly. We're looking, you know, it's not about me. So what if God designed us to live in this imperfect world so dependent and so caught up in experiencing the amazing reality of his person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that we would be so loved and cared for and cherished and relationally participating uh, with him in intimacy that even though we were engaged in whatever kinds of difficult situations, that kind of didn't matter as much. I would suggest that's the Christian life. That's the Christian life. Now, I'm not saying that we are tempted to worry. When does... When do we find ourselves becoming anxious and worried? What's, that the, what's the basis of worry and anxiety? Uh, it, well, it certainly is an aspect of fear. It couldn't be. Fear of what's currently happening, what might happen, or uh, uncertainty. But isn't, isn't anxiety and worry often predicated on a legitimate concern right yeah legitimate concerns mm -hmm. nothing wrong with legitimate concerns right. and we would immediately say that we have a responsibility uh, when these concerns that we face with that we have to deal with we have a responsibility now how we understand what our responsibility is relative to the concerns that we face. Now, that's, that's where we can get into anxiety and worry. So let's talk about that. I, I, I'd like to hear from you. You all have legitimate concerns, and God would have you to be responsible as you face those concerns. 
Now, how do you do so without becoming worried and anxious? It reminds me of like the, the cartoon visual. Talk up. It reminds me of like the cartoonish visual of a person standing in front of a giant, I don't know, like a, like a pipe. And then one hole appears and they plug their finger in it. And then another hole appears way down here and they plug their finger in that one. And the next thing you know, they got a hundred holes popping all over the place. And it, when we take matters into our own hands, it's because we fear a loss of control, which is a false belief, as if we had control over any of these situations, over our life anyway. So a lot of that, when we start to dabble in taking control and plugging all the holes, and the next thing you know, we're, dear Lord, <laughs> I can't handle this. Sometimes it takes that to get to the point of, Surrender. Okay. Good. So now how we're coming to a place of recognition. All right. This is completely out of my control. Uh, as Paul said here uh, in, the, in the text that we read here today, he said that, uh, that uh, where is that verse where he says that, you know, that he was becoming distressed beyond his ability to, to manage it. So now what do we do? So how, how are we responsible at that point of, as you would say, John, uh, surrendering the fact that we can't, we don't have enough fingers to plug the holes. Now what do we do? What is the proper way of being engaged? Do we just, do we just throw up our hands and say, okay, well, nothing, 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 nothing to participate in here? Do we just uh, advocate, or do we still have a responsibility? Uh, we have a responsibility. Okay, and so what is our responsibility? To cooperate with God and what he's telling us to do. Okay, to participate with God in what God is prompting us to do. So, so responsibility is simply you do have a choice in the matter as to how you respond, correct? So you respond to his ability. We're being tempted to respond based on a variety of other things that gives us the false sense of being in control. Did you notice that when you respond to God's ability that oftentimes you don't feel any more in control? Yeah. Awesome. I, I found the more you try to control, the more things seem to spiral. <laughs> Out of control. Well, and sometimes it's just the obvious that you you weren't in control of anything. Now you're beginning to recognize that you're not in control of anything. All these things were kind of already happening. Now you're just realizing there's nothing you can do about it. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of like news media today. You know, years ago, we didn't know all the stuff that's going around around the planet. But now, because of the Internet, we know of everything, you know, instantly. And so people that's think, oh, it's getting a lot worse. Well, no, it's that's been like this forever. <laughs> it's just you have access to it. So when you all of a sudden discover that you're not in control of anything, then you begin to realize how much you're not in control of. But trusting God, being responsive to God's activity, which, which is really faith. When you walk by faith, you're not in control. Now, he is, but you don't necessarily see it. You certainly don't necessarily immediately feel it. Okay? But you're, you're, you're acting on what you know to be true. Now, it's one thing to say that you believed God. It's another thing to walk by faith, trusting God. And I would suggest that that's the disconnect has been for centuries. That's the disconnect in Christians' lives. Oh, we can, we can wax eloquent relative to what we believe. We sang about it this morning. I couldn't help but think about it as we were singing I believe in the resurrection. I believe in God. I believe he can do this and that and the other. 
But then watch me this week. Watch me take control of my life. I think for me personally, perhaps for everybody out there, is that if we're talking about issues that are on the face of it, beyond my control, it's easier for me to say, oh Lord, I can't, only you can. But I think where, that, where the rubber meets the road, it's on those issues that don't seem to be that extreme. See, I'm not usually anxious about the things that I know I can't control. I'm anxious about my 17-year-old who I think I can control, <laughs> but I can't control. And so, so then it's not the ultimate, it's like, oh Lord, this is in your hands and I've got, you know, I've got the faith, it's there, I know that I have my limitations, but I think that being transformed from glory to glory, as it says in God's word, for me is in those issues that I don't have to have a perfect track record. I love, thank God, <laughs> I've left that behind and I'm still, you know, obviously it still crops up, but I know I don't have to be perfect, but there's some things that, that pop up on the day to day that God is refining me. And it's those issues where I will not act responsibly. In other words, responsive, responsive to the ability of God, I realize in the day to day or in a situational thing, in one next word, here in A, here in B, here in C. I realize that I'm now traveling down a road that I am taking management, I'm taking control. And it's in those glorious moments where I don't feel ashamed, it's a meeting, me personally, I'm, I'm face to face with God and I'm thinking, oh wow, this is what I'm doing. And he loving me, lovingly takes me by the hand and shows me those precious moments and it's, you know, for my maturity, my, you know, my, helping me along the way and being responsive to him because we know, we get it, right? What is the Christian life? It's responsibility, our response you know, to his activity within me. And I find that it's not the big issues, which in, in my mind I have resolved, it's in the small ones that daily crop up. Uh, crop up. Amen, amen. So, thank you. Uh, so what about this next question? What specific decisions or responsibilities are you now facing that need to be entrusted to God's hands? Because we all have stuff going on in our life, don't we? Now, you may start to think differently about how you might approach the things that need to be dealt with in your life. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a situation, and one of the things that helps us when you've gone through previous situations and the Lord, you rely on the Lord, and it kind of worked out. So it kind of helps you with your faith on other things. But there's also other times when I remember things in the past where kind of, you know, participate with the Lord. I didn't necessarily like where he was going. I had different ideas, you know. You know, and he had much better plans for me. And looking back, you see it, but going through it, you didn't like any minute of it, but you're just trusting it. Sometimes you have this stuff going on. Um, like I'm in a situation now where I really need to trust the Lord. And, and then it's, it's a fine line between plugging away with your responsibilities that you have, you know, at your work, your job, doing the things and trudging away. In, or do I fall into I'm going on autopilot and I'm not really listening to him? You know, I could, I'm saying, yeah, Lord you're in control here but then i still have like my job duties and things that i need to do so some sometimes it's hard to reconcile those two does that make sense yeah uh, listening to you uh share derek it, the words that came to my mind is you know whether it's love driven or fear driven right. you know oftentimes when we're concerned about something negatively happening we have those fears, we have those concerns, what if? Uh, now, it doesn't mean that that goes away, but if we are love motivated in spite of our fears, that's going to change how we engage those fears. Amen. And love covers a multitude of sins, doesn't it? Amen. And it gives us confidence. I mean, who is love? Obviously, the Lord Jesus is 
God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So, so when we know that we are participating with the one who is love, uh, that's the only security. We don't know what the outcome's going to be. We, we, we're not so much outcome-oriented anymore. We're God-oriented. We're, right. we, we're into the personal relationship. That's what matters. And now that doesn't make sense to people necessarily. That's okay. We're not asking that. You know, here, here's the thing about the Christian life. The Christian life is experienced by faith. Do you know what religion wants to do with all of us relative to our, quote, Christian lives? The Christian life, the, the religious life wants all of us to do the same thing. There's a sense of security or comfort in that, well, we're all doing it that way, so it must be the way to do it. I can guarantee you, I don't care what group you use as an, as an example, let's use our group here this morning. I can promise you that in the particulars of each of your lives, that it is not God's way for all of us to do it the same way. I can promise you that. Faith is an individual thing. Faith is personally being aware of and participating with God's voice to you. And that's why you should be very careful about offering your counsel to someone as to how they should do something. Don't do it. And more importantly, don't take that counsel. There is only one wonderful counselor, Amen. and that is Jesus Christ. And so the best we can do for one another is to encourage each other to listen under the voice of God and participate with him and walk by faith, which is going to be very scary. Amen. You're not going to have any confidence, particularly other than the confidence that you have in Christ, that what you're engaged in is going to be any different. doesn't matter. It's not about outcomes. It's about the relationship that you're experiencing in him. Now, that's very foreign to religion. Religion wants to give you formulas. Religion wants to give you principles. Religion wants to give you neat little packages of how things are supposed to be done. And everybody needs to, to conform to those religious standards. That's why religion is not Christianity. In fact... Our beliefs oftentimes can be our biggest hindrance to walking by faith. Because you start hearing God, you're liable to like, wait a minute, God, I, I don't really know how that kind of measures up to what I believe about you. And then you might hear kind of what I hear at times, and he'd say, no, it doesn't really, does it, Don? <laughs> your understanding of me is pretty flawed. <laughs> My ways are not your ways. Exactly. Okay? So, um, Major points out this one verse, and I want to digress a little bit on it. It's this verse in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, and it's verse 8 and 9. It's a pretty significant verse, two verses. Um, it's in the context of severe issues that we can experience the completeness of who we are in Christ. Doesn't mean all this stuff's going to go away, because it's not. And so he says, we were burdened beyond measure so that we were despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death death in ourselves that we should not trust oh, 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 that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead oh that sounds real encouraging no I am going to die and you're going to have to raise me from the dead Lord <laughs> he, 
Kind of like, sounds like what Abraham had to do, right? He had to be willing to offer his son Isaac. That was his basis of being able to do something that didn't make sense. He said, well, I know God can raise the dead, so I guess that's what's going to occur here. And so here we see a time in Paul's journey in Asia where he's probably referring to the, in the context, this major uproar that, that had happened because of his presence and because they were sharing about Jesus Christ and, and uh, Demetrius, the silversmith. You remember who he was? Remember those false gods there in uh, Corinth that he was speaking against? And there were so many people who were coming to Christ that Demetrius, who was the silversmith, was not a happy businessman. He was making money on all of the idols and all of the crafts and all of the, uh, you know, really basically satanic stuff they were putting together there. And so all these people coming to Christ, obviously they weren't buying his wares anymore. So he's taking a major loss. And so uh, Paul's stirring things up. Paul taught that Diana was a false god. And of course, Diana was not just a false god. It was all into all kind of sexual perversions and, and uh, debauchery. And that whole area was caught up in immorality. And so the gospel's coming in. People are getting saved. and They're beginning to allow Christ to be the basis of how they live. And so they're breaking away from this idolatrous, sinful lifestyle. And so Paul says that God is not made by human hands. So all these false images that they were worshiping and bowing down to, well, you don't need those anymore. Reminds me of the young woman when I was in um, Nicaragua and uh, doing a seminar, and uh, we had some interaction with a couple of them at one time and, and presented the gospel, and she was gloriously saved. And the next day, some of her friends came to me, and she said, did you hear what, did you hear what happened to Maria? I said, no, I didn't. They said, well, she went home last night. She gathered up all of her statues of Mary and Joseph and I don't know who all the saints were that she had statues of, and she put them all on her kitchen table. And then she announced to them, Christ is now my life. I have no need for you anymore. And she got rid of all that idolatry. And so... These men had made their living from the silver idols that they made of Diana. And business was down because there were so many converts to Christianity. This created an, a significant uproar. And the people of Ephesus began to gather into the great arena there in Ephesus. And one of Paul's companions, a man by the name of Alexander who was from Macedonia, was grabbed. We're going to get these Christians. We're going to, we're going to make an example of them because they're interfering with our business. And so they grabbed him and they pulled him into the arena. And there was just mobs of people. And most of them, you know, when you have a mob mentality, people don't even know why they're a part of the mob. You know, be careful about having any kind of sense of, of uh, security in numbers. The majority is typically wrong anyway. <laughs> so there's, there's no comfort in numbers, all right? And so they were just crowd followers, and Alexander signaled that he wanted to speak to the people. But when they realized that he was a Jew, they began for the space of two hours to chant, Great is Diana of Ephesus, great is Diana of Ephesus, great is Diana of Ephesus. They tried to drown him out. And Paul was trying to get into the arena, because that was his buddy. But his friends forcibly restrained him from entering. Why? Well, they knew if Paul entered in there, that would be his last arena visit. They put him to death. And so this is probably what Paul was referring to when he said that he had the sentence of death upon him. 
He refers to being pressed out of measure. Obviously, someone very dear to him had been incarcerated. No, no, no telling what was going to happen to him. This was beyond his capacity to deal with it. Here's, there's this, this is where he's talking about it was beyond measure. It was too big for him. It was nothing he could do. He couldn't handle the situation. It was above his strength. And he knew that he did not have the strength to deal with the situation. He knew the situation was completely out of his control. Mom mentality, things out of control. And he despaired of life. Not only for his, but probably for Alexander's. And he figured that, you know, this could be it. Uh, there was plenty of times where Paul probably felt that this could be it. <laughs> and we find ourselves in situations like that at times, don't we? And he was assuming that this could be the time he was going to die. And yet, in the midst of all this, he didn't begin to worry. He didn't begin to fret. He saw the purpose of God bringing him to this place that was beyond his control beyond his capacity to deal with, which was an opportunity that actually would force him or um, press him into a greater dependence and trust on the Lord. What's, what's pressuring you? What's potentially God using in your life to press you into a greater Awareness and participation with God. And as Paul was aware of this, his only hope was God's deliverance. And not just to be delivered, so to speak, from the mouths of the lion or from the arena or from death. But to be delivered from a fleshly way of responding to the pressures of life. He is the God who ultimately raises the dead, Paul figured out. Look. It was worse things than dying, compromising in your death. And so if God can raise the dead, then I'm not being concerned about putting myself where God wants me to put myself. He can deliver from the threat of death, and God brought him to the place to where he, even though he was in total despair of himself so that he would not trust in himself, but he was learning to press more into the resurrection life of Jesus Christ and trust God. Amen. <clears throat> and some of you may feel like Paul this morning. Some of you got some stuff and you're being pressed. You're over your head. You're drowning. You have done everything in your power. I know you have. Nothing's worked. And your analysis of the situation is that if something doesn't happen, I'm dead. You have despaired of hope. And you are certain that nothing can help you at this point. Nothing as far as your resources or your control. And you feel the sentence of death is on the situation. All right, so here's my question this morning for you. Have you ever thought that maybe God is present and that he wants to take advantage of this situation to allow you to experience a greater level of the supernatural working of his life in and through you in a situation that you thought was completely impossible. That, my friend, is the Christian life. It is amazing how that God so often uses adversity in circumstances to bring his people to a more complete trusting awareness of himself. In the natural realm, in our fleshly ways, we all want to be master manipulators, don't we? And we try to use every last resource to try to make something work. And it's great to see 
when we all come to the end of our rope. Now, we don't particularly like to be there, but it's a glorious place. Coming to the end of ourselves, when we don't longer have any more schemes, no more tricks, nothing else to do, we are just desperately dependent on God. You don't have anyone else to turn to. God is the only hope left. Now, I, I don't really feel like we need to get to that hopeless situation to experience God. We should live in the reality that we are not adequate in ourselves. We should live in the reality that God is our life. That we should, we should not be surprised at these situations that we find ourselves in. Rather, we should look forward to the opportunities to be pressed in by his love to a greater dependency, a greater awareness, and a greater experientiality of his life as ours. Amen. And so, when you've hit the wall, that's the greatest opportunity to experience the miraculous working of Christ as your life. And then it's something you will have experienced. You will have known it. You will be able to share what you know to be true. It'll no longer just be a belief. It'll be a faith experienced reality. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not yet seen. And so the Christian life is experienced by faith. So Christ more than the complete answer. The Christian life is life as God intended. And as you and I learn to allow these concerns not to be translated into worries and anxious moments, but rather the supernatural opportunities to experience that which we won't be able to explain any other way but then, but God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.